Alphas, welcome to the Alpha Male Podcast, the podcast where we talk about what it means to be a man, made in the very image of God, strong, dominant, in control. We don't apologize for that. What are we going to talk about today? I think a pretty cool episode. I've been thinking on this for a while. If you've listened for any length of time, you've probably heard the Manly Skills episode. This is kind of Manly Skills 2.0. I've been wrestling with the title for a while, and I think I'm going to call this one Troglodyte James Bond. If you don't know a troglodyte is somebody that lives in a cave, a caveman. Kind of a mix of caveman stuff and James Bond stuff, that next level of Manly. Hopefully stuff you'll find really cool and interesting and stuff you may want to implement and learn in your life. This is not stuff you can click with a button and put in an Amazon cart and buy it. This is stuff you have to get your hands dirty, get your brain engaged, and actually do instead of click. With that, if this is not your first rodeo here, if you like this podcast, you think the culture needs this, you want to support, please consider becoming a patron, goodshepherdtraining.com. There'll also be a link in the show notes. With that, I'm going to plug in the bio, and then we'll get into the main topic. So, who am I? Who is this person talking to you from across the internet? Why should you listen? First and foremost, I am a Christian, a servant of God, and a follower of Jesus Christ. God has blessed me to do many things in my life, for I could do nothing apart from him. U.S. Marine Corps combat veteran did a couple of tours in Iraq. As an assaultment after my combat tours, I was an urban warfare instructor for the Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. Also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. Also did several years in law enforcement, LAPD. I worked regular assignments and more specialized assignments. Been a private contractor for a three-letter government agency. That's all I'll say about that. Been blessed to be a state rifle and pistol champion. And West Coast Regional Rifle Champion won more shooting competitions with the talent that God's given me than I can actually remember. Was blessed to be the commander of a tactical team in a large metropolitan area. Our primary job, the reason we primarily existed, was to stop active shooters. I got the opportunity to head up and be the commander of that team. I grew up around guns, hunting and shooting, and competing at a very early age. I've been blessed to hunt all over this beautiful country from Whitetail on the East Coast to Mulder on the West Coast and bear and elk and all manner of things. I've even been a professional big game hunter and guide. But again, most importantly, I'm a Christian. And I am your host, Michael Melito. Welcome to the podcast. Taking your manliness up a notch. That next level. Because that's one of the marks of an alpha. Not just being good enough. Being awesome. Being great. If basic level fitness is running and push-ups and pull-ups, which every man should do. Bumping up to that next level, doing some wind sprints, pushing yourself, lifting free weights, stuff like that. If swimming is your basic skill, free diving, long distances, long amounts of time underwater, that's kind of your next level. And again, we've done a manly skills episode. I think you should have those skills. If you don't hear something you think should be on here, make sure you've listened to that one. And again, this is next level. This is not basic. This is not tying your shoes. I've talked in other podcasts about the importance of lock picking. Not for any nefarious purpose. There's good reasons to know how to lock pick. You lock yourself out of your own house, out of your own shed, out of your own padlock that you've put on something. A gym locker. Who knows what. Real world example. I was recently where I hail from. Southern United States, Eastern Shore. One of my best friends, the only time he had to hang out was to wake up super early and go hunting in the morning, which I didn't mind. Told his dad to leave the door unlocked so he could... Well, we got there in the morning, and guess what? Forgot to leave it unlocked. The door was locked. I know him. I know his parents. I know the house. Just a real-world example of how that skill can come in handy. 
The next level of that, mechanical breaching. Mechanical breaching. I cannot recall the number of doors that I've kicked in. Now, I've led a different background than most of you listening. I've been a professional door kicker. That's been part of both training and real-world experience, kicking in doors. But I think you ought to have that skill if you want to bump up to the next level and figure out a way to do this. Maybe a door that you're going to remove anyway. Maybe a building that's going to be demolished. Sometimes they demolish whole blocks in inner cities and places like that. You find the opportunity where you can practice kicking in a door. That's a skill you might want to have, and it is a skill. You'd be surprised at the ease that most doors, most residential doors, commercial doors, can be kicked in very easily. And people will say, oh, but a deadbolt. Yeah, a deadbolt is fine, and a deadbolt itself is strong, but if the door frame is wood, and it's you know, a half inch of wood on each side, how hard is it to break a half inch of wood if you're an alpha male? Not super hard, right? Knowing how to kick in a door, knowing how to take a sledgehammer to a door and open it. And not just like beating a hole into it. I'm talking about an efficient way to open a door. And there's many reasons for this that you might want to have. And again, not for any nefarious reason. Literally, the building is burning down and somebody's trapped on the other side. And they're not an alpha male and they can't open that door. You might want to be able to open that door instead of waiting for 15 minutes for first responders to show up. Because guess what? If you're there, you're the first responder. Somebody is legit assaulting someone on the other side of that door, and you know it. You ought to be able to get into that room efficiently. An elderly person has slipped and fallen on the other side of a door, and they need help now. They're bleeding, their head's bleeding, whatever. Cut themselves really bad. Sadly, suicides are a thing, attempted suicides. Maybe somebody is on that other side of that door that really needs you. Not the time to figure out how to kick a door to open it. You should know that or to take a hammer to a door and open it. So again, this is next level stuff, right? But man up. If you have the opportunity to learn that skill, then learn that skill. I'll take a brief aside and talk about some things I'm not going to teach you. I could teach you a lot about demolitions, courtesy of the U.S. government. I know how to make all manner of demolitions. Teach you how to crimp a blasting cap and the detonation velocity of C4 and how a claymore works. I could even teach you how to make explosives. Go into any, maybe not any, but stores that most suburbia would have and being able to make explosives. I'm not going to teach you that because I don't want to go to prison. Is that a manly skill? Is that a next level manly skill? It sure is, but I'm not going to teach it to you. Likewise, the chokehold. A blood choke. Not just like a brawler would use in a bar, but like an efficient rear naked choke. A carotid choke. Things like that that can things that can end a fight real fast. For whatever reason, now in this culture that has become somehow unacceptable, I would say like most other things, there's a right and a wrong time to do stuff. Jesus told his disciples, if you do not have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. And he also, Peter, for using his sword at the improper time, at a time when he was supposed to be going to the cross to fulfill becoming our sacrifice for sin. There's a right and a wrong time to use these tools, but there are perfectly legit, reasonable times to use these skills and have these skills. But me on a podcast, carte blanche, is not the venue for those things. But some of these things today, I think... Pretty much everybody should know and practice, and I don't have a problem giving out that information. Like mechanical breaching. Moving on from not teaching you a carotid chokehold, which can easily be deadly force. How about restraints? We talked about manly skills. Every man should know how to throw a punch, throw a kick. Taking that to the next level, do you know physical restraints? Do you know how to do an arm bar? to take somebody into custody. One of my good friends one time apprehended a criminal running out of Walmart. Surprise, surprise. And grabbed him, put him on the ground. Wasn't a police officer, wasn't anything like that. It varies from state to state, but most citizens have a right to a citizen's arrest. Usually a felony committed in your presence. That's a good manly skill to have, taking it to the next level. A punch is not the right tool in that scenario. Getting that person restrained and holding them there is the right 
thing in that scenario and a lot of other scenarios. Perhaps it's after a few punches have been thrown and you want to restrain that person as much for their safety as for yours because the longer that fight goes, even if you're winning, the longer that fight goes and the more punches get thrown, the more chance there are for very serious injury. If you can restrain that person painfully but safely, you may prevent injury not just to you and to bystanders but also to them. Maybe the best thing for them to put them on the ground and put them in an arm bar. Do you have those skills? Do you know those skills? That, again, that's every man should know how to throw a punch. Maybe that next level, do you know how to restrain somebody? And going on that, knowing how to use handcuffs. There's techniques. If somebody's unconscious, pretty much anybody can throw on handcuffs. But can you cuff somebody that's trying to get away from you? That's a skill. Maybe something you want in your toolbox. You know I'm big into prepping and preparedness. You should have food, you should have water, you should carry a gun on you as a man. Maybe having a handcuff set or two in your car is that next level. You should probably know, you know, a chimpanzee could probably figure out how to put handcuffs on another chimpanzee. But can you throw cuffs on somebody on the ground when they're wrestling around trying to get up? That's what I'm talking about. That's a skill. Maybe that next level skill that you should know as a man. As an alpha male anyway. What about camo? How about that? Not just having camo. Not just clicking on Amazon and buying the next new multicam cool thing. But knowing how to be clandestine. How to be covert. James Bond stuff, right? It doesn't have to be anything crazy. That gray man concept has been bantered around. Probably overused, but... Do you know how to blend in with whatever environment you are? Maybe in Nampa, Idaho, that's a pair of jeans and a camo, you know, real tree or mossy oak hoodie and a black rifle coffee mug. In downtown Salt Lake City, maybe that's black slacks and a white button-up shirt. In Fort Worth, that might be cowboy boots, a Stetson, And a big shiny belt buckle. In the middle of the cypress swamps trying to stalk up and kill an animal. That might be a leaf suit and mosquito netting on your face and bug dope all over your hands. But knowing how to camo into that environment. How to be patient, how to be still, how to blend in. Whether it's rocky outcroppings out in the Sonoran Desert or a subway. Kind of the inverse of that, people not being able to notice or gather intel on you. How about gathering intel on other people? Intel gathering. Gathering useful information. And again, not for any nefarious purpose. Let's say that there's been quite a few vehicle break-ins in your corner of suburbia. You notice an older black Honda Civic driving around really slow. You've never seen him in your neighborhood before. You don't live on a through street didn't seem to stop at any houses they drove by real slow and the next day you heard a couple neighbors talking about how their cars got broken into two weeks later you see that same black honda civic driving by and the next day a couple of different neighbors say hey my car got broken into that intel gathering you notice that car but did you get a license plate did you notice any stickers that distinguish that vehicle from other vehicles I just noticed that it was a black Honda Civic, but you know the year. You notice there was a small dent on the front right side panel. These are things I picked up a lot in my years in law enforcement. You kind of, by default, become a really good observer if you want to be a good cop. I talk about working more specialized assignments. I worked fugitive recovery, finding, hunting down fugitives. Situational awareness is a big part of that. And I think as a man, you should have that situational awareness for danger. But intel gathering is kind of that 2.0. Whether cavemen of the past noticing habits of birds or James Bond, spy type stuff. Being able to gather that intel, that's a big part of what spies do. Are you good at gathering intel? I remember one time after I was a cop, I was driving around and I saw, I noticed a car behind me. And I made a couple of turns and the car was still behind me. And I thought, what are the odds of that? making all those turns so instead of going home I made a couple of random turns and sure enough they followed me 
Then I made it a point to lose that car. I didn't go home until I was sure that car wasn't following me. I drove somewhere else. Sure enough, a while later, and I don't remember, it's been years ago. Somebody that I knew, and I didn't know them that well, so I didn't know what kind of car they drove. They said, hey, we were following you the day we were... We're going to stop and say hi. I didn't know who that was, and I didn't want them knowing where I lived because I didn't know who was following me. But sure enough, somebody was following me. If I hadn't been gathering that intel, I would have just gotten out, and that person would have gotten out. And in that situation, that would have been fine, but not in every situation. Another real easy example, nothing nefarious, gathering intel. Let's say your neighbor, you know, she's a nice young girl. She was maybe with a guy she shouldn't have been, and they had a nasty breakup. And now, just through talking to her, you know she's got a restraining order against said man. You're familiar with the car. A situation you might want to gather intel and be extra vigilant. You know she's got a restraining order. You've talked about it. It says he can't be within X number of feet. And you see him stop in front of her house. You know, being able to, number one, contact authorities before she has to deal with it, right? Protecting those weaker than you, that's part of being an alpha male. Maybe just your presence as a man, standing outside, looking at him, letting him know that you see him. He's going to do something really bad. He doesn't want anybody to know that he's there about to do something really bad. Just you making your presence known that, hey, I'm here. I see you. You don't even have to intercede and hopefully you don't. That intel gathering can be a very good thing. What you do with intel is on you, but having the skill to gather useful intelligence is a great thing. It's not just for spies. It can be for you, too. And there's any number of situations where that comes in really handy. Part of being a really good, successful hunter, you think completely different world, talking about a troglodyte James Bond. A good hunter knows. He gathers intel on, hey, when we get a cold snap this time of year, that means this for the animals going into rut. By gathering intel every year, my best friend and I had a pretty good idea when the rockfish would be running in a certain bridge way inland of where they normally were. Normally they're out in the ocean, saltwater fish. These big rockfish would come and spawn way up inland. We lived in a little tiny town. And just year after year gathering intel, we had a pretty good idea when that was going to be. And we would slay those things. We knew through years of gathering intel what kind of bait they liked, when they were going to be active. We gathered that intel, right? And it paid off. Your ancestors did the same thing because they survived living off the land like that. Good intel gathering is a timeless skill. Whether you live off grid in the wilderness or you live in a cul-de-sac in Scottsdale. Talking about a skill that transcends but that our ancestors were very familiar with. Tracking. Being a good tracker. Most people, even a little kid, if you took them in the woods and showed them you know, the mud around a pond and said, what is that? They could probably at a certain age say, hey, that's a deer. That's pretty basic. Is it a male deer? Is it a female deer? You can tell that usually by how they stand, how they walk, the way their feet fall with each other. Just a deer came through, through here. How long ago did that deer go through there? A lot of times you can tell by how they urinate on the ground what kind of deer it is. Not just, hey, wild hogs were here. Well, why were they there? What were they doing? Were they bedding? Were they feeding? If they were feeding, what were they feeding on? I don't often quote from Hollywood. I don't even have a TV. Every once in a while, I think Hollywood makes something worth watching. It reminds me of the scene in No Country for Old Men. He tracks down the money. And he thinks like the bad guy. You know, if I was going, if I was in a situation, where would I go? Where would I stop? He finds a dude. He's pretty savvy. A Vietnam vet. He has that skill of tracking. He was just earlier tracking a wounded animal. That's what led him to the spot. And he used those same tracking skills to track down whatever it was, a million dollars. Or I forget how much it was. I don't really care. But you get the point. And I've done the same thing. I grew up hunting. I've been a professional hunter and guide. I use those same skills in an urban environment. When I was a commander of a tactical team, there was a suspect that had seemingly gotten away. Tons of people were there on the scene before I showed up. I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying that God blessed me with this talent. I was able to track down where that suspect went because I had the skill of tracking. A lot of people grow up in the city and they never develop that skill. They're never in law enforcement. They're not familiar with hunting. I was able to track a human being through a parking garage. 
because I had the skill of tracking. There's a lot to that skill. You can't just click it on Amazon. You might be able to click a book on what different animal tracks and stuff are. If you want to be a tracker, you got to spend time tracking. You got to spend time in the wilderness. If you want to be good at baseball, I could care less about baseball, but if you want to be good at baseball, you can order all the books you want on baseball. But if you want to be good at it, you got to spend time on the baseball field. If you want to be good at tracking, you got to spend time tracking. If you know you can look at a field of leaves, seemingly look random, but you are familiar enough with the forest, you look and say, hey, the wind didn't blow these leaves that way. Something came through here, even if you can't see tracks, and you can kind of study it. You know that deer generally move in long straight lines. You know how squirrels move. You can look and say, hey, there was a half a dozen squirrels here. That makes sense. Acorns are falling. Or, hey, that looks like a big deer following a doe through those leaves. Guess what? You can also look at carpet in an urban environment and say, hey, somebody walked through here recently. Carpet's been vacuumed, and I know somebody walked this way on this carpet. Sometimes this comes in handy. How about this? I'm talking about intel gathering and being able to get into places and out of places. Looking where people have been. Looking where animals have been. That's part of tracking. A lot of places have keypads. A lot of times you can look at a keypad and tell what numbers have been touched repeatedly over and over and over again on a keypad. You're trying to figure out the combination to something. Again, don't you can do this for totally legit righteous reasons or nefarious reasons. You shall not steal. But you can look at a keypad and usually tell what numbers, if, as long as it's been there for more than a day or two, right? If somebody's repeatedly gone in and out day after day after day using the keypad, you can usually look at the keypad and tell, hey, what numbers, where have people's fingers been? And you can cut that down from seemingly thousands of combinations to a few combinations if you know people and you know habits a lot of people default to the easiest thing so if it's a series of numbers a lot of times it'll just go in numerical order right i mean a lot of times it will not all the time but hey i'd call that an offshoot of tracking skills Here's one I probably wouldn't have put on the list 20 years ago, but I will today because I think a lot of people, not even much younger than me, but maybe even just a little younger than me, navigation. And not by plugging it in to your GPS on your phone. And I'll be honest, I love the GPS on my phone. It gets me all over the place. I travel all over the country. I live semi-nomadically. It's really nice when I go to a strange city to be able to punch in the address of something. It's way better than it used to be with the old Thomas Guide maps you flip through a giant book to figure out what blocks you are in this city and find out how to get from here to there. That nav is really nice. That automatic GPS and updates if you make a wrong turn, that's really nice. And I think you should make use of that technology. But I think navigation beyond that, you ought to have that. With a map and a compass, can you navigate? both in the woods and in the city. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country, Deuteronomy 28. Being able to navigate both those environments. And you'd think I'd be great at navigation, but I'll be honest with you. I am not naturally good at directions and navigating, especially in urban environments. I often delegate that to my wife when we're in a city, especially one neither one of us is familiar with. She's way better intuitively at directions than I am. I don't know why, just one of the things I'm not that great at naturally. I have to work at it really hard. Inside a city, inside a shopping mall, it seems like my wife can, oh yeah, we came in this way, we got to go this way, and we'll get back to our car. Me, ugh, no. But I still work at that skill. Even if I'm not naturally good at it, I just have to work at it harder. Some of these skills may come easier or harder to you than others. But navigation, not just with a GPS. What if there is no GPS for whatever reason? Can you read a topographical map? Can you look at a topographical map, one with the contour lines, and look at it and kind of picture it in your head? Kind of imagine that landscape in your mind. That's what I'm talking about. Navigation. How about another one? What's cooler than booby traps? 
Trapping is a cool skill. I've done episodes on trapping. Part of being a professional hunter was also being a professional trapper. Knowing how to make traps is kind of that next level. Trapping is not easy. People think that it is. They think, oh, you know, when the balloon goes up or the peanut butter and chocolate hits the fan, I'm just going to trap. I've got snare wire. Trapping is a hard skill to even have, let alone master. I would not call myself a master at it. And I've done it professionally. I'd call myself capable. Trapping is hard. Trying to figure out not just where that animal is going to go, but an inch or two where they're going to step or put their head. Even with conibear traps. But booby trapping, knowing how to make traps, both for man and beast. And again, doesn't have to be anything nefarious. Can be totally good and on the up and up. Can you make a deadfall trap? Can you make a snare with a piece of snare wire and a sapling? And have a reasonable degree that it's actually going to work? taking it to the next level you think this is only a caveman skill it's a very urban skill you'd think in iraq with all the cool stuff we had thermal sights and night vision and all kinds of crazy stuff we're way past the points of making primitive traps but guess what we made people couldn't sneak up on us at night in urban environments we made booby traps as simple as long lines of fishing string clear cheap fishing string with aluminum cans and rocks so that anybody trying to get near our position would make a ton of noise yeah we use those up there with our 50 caliber machine guns why because they work and they might work for you too maybe you know there's been burglaries in your area you know there's been crime afoot or maybe it's a time of civil unrest and looting we've all seen that recently if you've lived if you're older than four I've lived through times of civil unrest and the George Floyd stuff and rioting. I certainly did, and I was dealing with that as a professional. Something as simple, again, as clear fishing string and cans and rocks. Just to give you an early warning, time gives you options. Advanced warning gives you preparation and time. Something as simple as that, and those are effective. That's a very good, easy, simple, effective booby trap something little boys know very well I mean, especially me as I, when I was a kid when I was a kid I was always outside making booby traps and stuff like that and as long as it's not super dangerous maybe you want to encourage that in young men maybe that's a skill that comes in handy in life it certainly came in handy with me in my life talking about being a law enforcement fugitive recovery whatever a not nefarious reason perhaps I want to engineer knowing the landscape where they're urban suburban or rural when that my query that happens to be you know a felon a fugitive knowing almost certainly where that person's going to go and where they're going to run and maybe engineering that environment so they go a certain way and they get apprehended versus escaping with booby traps don't have to be elaborate it can literally be putting chairs behind doors so that they can't go that way they and they'll try it and go another way and they'll go another way and then bam you've got something there waiting for them a team waiting to take that person into custody or whatever the case may be guess what i can do the same thing for coyotes they're trying to get in to kill stuff inside a fence i can that landscape so they move a certain way and have to avoid this way and avoid that way and they're probably going to go this way and guess what i've got a snare there Again, that next level skill. Booby traps. It does not have to be a claymore mine or a punji pit. How about this one? Structure hardening. Sometimes there is looting. Sometimes there is rioting. Sometimes there is civil unrest. Sometimes somebody you know or love may have a restraining order against somebody and you can't be there all the time to protect them. Hardening a structure. Maybe that next level. Again, manly skills. Every man ought to carry a gun, I believe. If you feel called to protect yourself and others, and you're legally allowed to, every man ought to know how to throw a punch and things like that. The next level, one of the next levels, structure hardening. Tell you a story, we recently went, I love my wife, she's got family. I I guess it's not technically in Detroit, it's on one of the little growths outside of Detroit apartment complex whatever that's where her family is she loves her family i love her we went there for thanksgiving i noticed that her i'm not going to say i noticed a certain person 
their apartment, they had a really big beefy lock on the front door. And I thought, oh, that's nice. And then I walk around and the back of that apartment, almost the entire back of it, a big chunk of the back of it is a giant sliding glass door. Not only that, but right outside, there's a pond. And on the bank of that pond, talking like right outside, there's a rock pile of big, giant rocks. And the back of her house is a sliding glass door. Might want to harden that up. Or choose a different location if you're picking an apartment. One of my rules I'll give out as kind of a tactical tip inside the episode. If you're going to stay in a hotel, you're going to get an apartment or whatever, look at a second story. It's usually usually easier to break into a first story. Tunnels a lot of times will go for the low hanging fruit. Oh, in this case, literally means the first level. It's easier for them to get in and out. The second level is usually less desirable for them, but for you, it's off the ground. If somebody's going to break in big sliding glass windows. They're probably going to break in the first story, not the second story, right? Also. It's not so high that you can't jump out of it if the building is burning down or somebody breaks in a home invasion, they break in the front door. It's not so high that you can't jump down off the second story. So if you can, if you have the option, looking for apartments, whatever, you're good in a hotel room. If you can, you want the second story. It's a good balance. Yeah, the 10th story might be harder to get to, but it's also harder for you to get out of. You're not jumping... I'm probably surviving jumping out of 10 stories on the top if somebody breaks in the front or the building's burning down and you can't get to a fire escape. The whole hallway is blocked with fire. Second story, you jump out. Yeah, you might twist your ankle or something, but unless some crazy thing happens, you're probably not going to die jumping out of a second story window. A lot of times, mobs, rioting, they'll just move through neighborhoods and they'll take easy targets. Here's a good, quick, easy thing. We're about to be in a season where a lot of packages and stuff are getting delivered. If you get that big screen TV, don't put the big giant box outside next to your trash can so that any criminal driving by is going to say, hey, that person just got this and this and this. That looks expensive. I'd like to have that. Coveting is often the beginning of taking. Remove that coveting. They don't see that you have it. Don't put that big screen TV box outside by your trash. Put it in the back of your truck or the back of your car. And the next time you drive somewhere with a dumpster, throw it in the dumpster. Instead of leaving it outside for an entire day and night. So people driving by looking for stuff to steal say, hey, we just got a giant TV. And not just TVs. That goes for a lot of stuff like that. It could be as simple as that trash discipline. It could be something like taking really short, cheap wooden steaks that you could buy at Home Depot or whatever. They're not expensive. And spools of just, not even razor wire, right? Just regular bailing wire. It's not expensive. Again, putting those differing distances, pounding them into the ground if there is rioting, civil unrest, things like that, and winding them in your front yard. People can't just walk or especially run through your yard up to your house. Again, it'll give you time. And if the hopefully the civil unrest goes away and nothing happened you can just pull up the stakes grass will go back fine just weaving random patterns of that wire and those stakes in your yard or just in front of or just behind your fence if you have one so that it's really hard to get over that fence quickly if they land on the other side they're probably going to trip and fall especially at night simple easy things like that structure hardening Doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Doesn't have to be super complicated. Military has been using that for a long time. You can look up how to do stuff like that. Good, cheap, easy insurance. If there is civil unrest, if the grid is down, if there's mass rioting and looting, and people are just going from house to house. Again, usually they go for the easy targets. Don't be an easy target. Don't be a soft target. Be a hard target. That's kind of what I'm talking about. This podcast is already running a little bit long and I still have quite a few skills that I had on here. Maybe I'll have to do a part two if you guys like this. Give me some feedback. You can contact me at goodshepherdtraining.com. Patrons, they pretty much have free reign to contact me. I encourage you to become a patron, but if you want to or not, you can still contact me at goodshepherdtraining.com. Hopefully you've liked this. I know not all these skills are going to apply to everybody or not going to be desirable for everybody, for every man out there. Some of these you might think, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. I'd like to 
I'd like to learn that. I might do a part two again. There's a quite a few other skills I have that I'm just not going to get to. We're already going pretty long on this episode. So I'm not going to include a bunch more skills on this. But here's the next level ultimate skill. More than all these, if you don't do any of these, if you're fine wearing your... I'm not even going to go there. You dress how you want. But out of all these skills, understanding God as the sovereign creator and maintainer and sustainer of the heavens and the earth and everything in them, understanding sin and that you need salvation and a Savior, Jesus Christ, going to that next level, that 2.0, be a student continually of the Bible, of the Word of God. So many people in today's culture and society walk around lost, not knowing what's the meaning of life, what they're supposed to be doing in life, what's right, what's wrong. God gave us an instruction manual for life, for you and for me. Read it. Read it. Turn off the Netflix. I haven't read your Bible yet today. Until you read your Bible, stop listening to podcasts. Before you listen to another one, read the Word of God. What's in there is far more important than what I'm telling you here. That's real truth. Read your Bible. So many people that call themselves Christian don't have a basic understanding of what God says they're supposed to be doing in life. What Jesus says. Salvation is too great a thing. There is no salvation by proxy. At the end of your days and my days. At the end of days. Period. It is written, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. It's great if you go to church. That's 1.0. Take it upon yourself. Read your Bible. Especially as a man. Especially as head of household. It's your job. Understand that and share that. When your knee bows and your tongue confesses and you give an account of things done in the body, whether good or bad, as the Bible says that we will. Your preacher's not going to be there kneeling with you. You're not going to matter what Baptist church says or what the Lutherans say or what the Catholics say. You're going to be judged. What does God say? Do you even know what he says? Again, there's no salvation by proxy. You don't get salvation by listening to a preacher. I encourage you, if you want to, Simple Man Sermons. It's the flagship podcast. It's what started all these other podcasts, Simple Man Sermons. I try to give you good theology there. But that's not on me. It's on you. You need to read your Bible. I am not perfect. I am not infallible. Only Christ was the infallible man that came down to die for your sins. Not me. I'm not going to be there with you on Judgment Day. You need to read your Bible. You need to understand it. You need to swim in it and be bathed by it. You need to be immersed in it. That's your 2.0. That's important. That's more important than all these other skills. Having an understanding and a relationship. Seeking and finding God. Tactical verse of the day. 2 Corinthians. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether good or bad. With that, men, thanks for listening, and have a blessed day.